Hello class. What we're going to talk about now is ethers. So what is an ether? Let's make sure you remember that. An ether, simply put, is something that looks, that's the generic structure, where you have an oxygen atom that's sandwiched between two alkyl groups. Now, when we take a look at an ether, that's just a very simple generic structure. These R groups right here, they can be the same, they can be different. So if they're the same, let's say these R groups are ethyl groups, then we have a diethyl ether. That would be a symmetrical ether. But then what if we had something that looked like that? We see this side right here has three carbons and this side has two. That would be an unsymmetrical ether. But this generic structure right here, <clears throat> the sky's the limit on exactly what type of structures you can have. So for example, let me draw this molecule. So let's draw a benzene ring right here. And then we have what? We have a stereo center here. CH3 there. <clears throat> Let's see, what do I want to attach to this one? Another benzene ring, like so. And then on the, this position, that, a carbon with three fluorines. What do we have here? What type of functional group do we have? Look at that. That right there is an ether because there's an oxygen sandwiched between two alkyl groups. Yes, this one right here would be what? A secondary amine. There's that functional group, but here is a ether. And you can see that just by, if I just circle or square that right there. <clears throat> alkyl, alkyl. It doesn't matter what those groups are. As long as they're carbon, that would make it an ether. So what's the difference between an ether and an ester? An ester has a carbonyl piece right there. I don't want you to get confused because when you take a look at this generic uh, ester here, you could envision <coughs> that there's a carbon right there and a carbon there, right? So is that not an ether? It's not because if one of those R groups that's directly attached to the oxygen, if that is a carbonyl, like so, then we have an ester. So watch out for those carbonyls. That will make it an ester. Right. <clears throat> so if I were to, so one thing I forgot to mention, what is interesting about this molecule right here, it is an ether, but many of you have seen or heard of this molecule before because its name is R, let's do that. This is one of the names. Yeah. Now would you be able to look at this molecule and come up with a, not an IUPAC name. Okay. But this molecule is actually Prozac. And Prozac is a molecule or a drug that helps uh, with mental illness and depression and things like that. Okay, so isn't that cool? So Prozac is a either. Also make sure, 
that you know how to name ethers. And we've discussed how to do this at the beginning of the semester. So I'm not going to go over that in the, this video because we've already done it. But make sure when you come to class or preparing for the exam that you know how to use the IUPAC rules to name ethers. So let's take a look at some properties here. Physical properties and just do a comparison amongst different types of functional groups. So let's say we take a propane molecule right here. A simple alkane. What is its boiling point? Negative 42 degrees Celsius. Okay. A very, very low boiling point. Now, what if we had a alcohol, okay. like ethanol? Look how, how much it jumps. 78 degrees C. That's the boiling point of ethanol. Major jump. Why was there a major jump? Hopefully you're all saying, well, both of these molecules have van der Waal <coughs> forces. That's where you have, what are the forces of this propane? You could take a propane molecule like so, and it can then also interact with other propane molecules. It's kind of like stacking on one another, right? And there's all these van der Waal forces between each of these. Remember that from general chemistry? So ethanol also has those van der Waal forces. Right, we could go something like this, and so there's going to be these van der Waal forces. And more of the intramolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. So propane only has van der Waals, but ethanol has van der Waals and hydrogen bonding. Remember, you can have a hydrogen bond between a oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen. If you have hydrogen atoms attached to any of these three atoms, you can have hydrogen bonding. So we see we have an oxygen directly attached to a hydrogen. So that means we can have a hydrogen bond. And the way we hydrogen bond here is this right here has a hydrogen, so it can donate, it's a donor. And so this hydrogen right here can get really close to another and I'm going to um, put the hydrogen there of that other ethanol like that because technically, if I do this right, that it's a bent molecule, right? So that's bent. So let's take this, just draw it a little bit differently here. Okay, so we have our two ethanol molecules. Now the reason why we have an increase in boiling point is because we have the hydrogen bond. Here's our hydrogen bond donor. And so we have some a lone pair right here on the oxygen and we have another one. But this hydrogen is what? Partially positive because of the electronegativity of this oxygen atom. All right. This oxygen is sucking electron density towards itself to make that partially positive. Well, if that's partially positive, then the lone pair on an adjacent molecule can feel that attraction towards that hydrogen. So here's a hydrogen, bond, hydrogen donor, hydrogen bond acceptor, and that forms a hydrogen bond, which increase because now we have van der Waals and hydrogen bonding increases the boiling point. So let's take a look now, since this is the ether chapter, what if we had an ether? Well, let's actually draw, let's draw an ether that looks like this, okay? We see that it's a bent molecule. 
And to actually be bent, we would have to have our lone pairs over here, like so. Okay? So there's our dimethyl ether. Now what it, where do you think the boiling point of this dimethyl ether should be? Should it be greater than 78, less than this, or in the middle? What do you think? Does this molecule have van der Waal forces? Yes, it does. Every molecule has van der Waal forces. So, what other intramolecular forces does this molecule have <coughs> which could influence its boiling point? Well, when we actually do the experiment and ask what its boiling point is, it's negative 25 degrees C. Okay. So it's actually in between these two. <coughs> So the ether has a higher boiling point than the alkane, but a lower boiling point than this. So how can we look at some intramolecular interactions to kind of understand why this is the case? Well, do, aren't there any hydrogens directly attached to that oxygen? So can it do any hydrogen bonding with itself? So, for example, let's draw ourselves the ether that looks like this. And then let's draw another ether molecule like this. I'm going to expand out the hydrogens here on that methyl. So this methyl right there is that methyl. I've just expanded it out. And we could expand out that one if we'd like. Now, can you hydrogen bond with this lone pair to that hydrogen that's attached to that carbon? Pause the video and answer that question. Can that be a legit hydrogen bond? I hope all of you are saying no way. Because what did I just previously say? You can only have hydrogen bonding if the hydrogen is attached to a fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. This hydrogen right here is attached to what? A carbon. So there is no hydrogen bonding that can occur between the, the this ether. And it does not happen. So our ether does not have hydrogen bonding, but why does it have a slightly higher boiling point than the propane? Well that's because it has this molecule here has a intramolecular interaction that propane does not have. So what is that? Well, if we take a closer look at our oxygen here, or our ether, like so, we have our lone pairs there, and we have our methyl groups over here. So these electrons in this bond right here, if we represented them as just two electrons, because that's exactly what they are, these two electrons, are they going to be shared between the carbon and the oxygen equally? And we've learned in general chemistry, no, the more electronegative atom is going to kind of like hug or hold on to the electrons more than the non-electronegative or the less electronegative atom. So the oxygen is um, holding on to the electrons in between these carbon-oxygen bonds a little bit more tightly. And so what we could do is we can represent that <coughs> as a uh, individual dipole. All right. That's what those pink arrows are showing. That on the on this side is more positive, 
and on this side it's more electronic or more negatively charged. So you see that little, it kind of looks like a plus sign right there. So that's the plus side, telling us less electrons, the arrow, more electrons. And so when you do some math and sum up these individual uh, dipole moments, and this is just caused because of the electronegativity difference between oxygen and carbon, we eventually have, when you sum up those individual dipole moments, you can generate a net dipole. And what it kind of looks like mathematically is like this. Right. So this molecule, because it's bent, and the, what we're showing here is that this side right here of the ether is what? Partially positive. And then this side right here of the ether is going to be more negative. So we have generated a dipole. And so dipoles can interact with one another. So for example, if you have this ether right here, and on the bottom half of it has a positive dipole, or there's a dipole, and because of that dipole, you have a positive face, then the next ether, how would you think it would orient itself? Do you think it would orient itself like this? When it's interacting with this molecule up here? No, that wouldn't make sense because we have what? A dipole like that. And so this positive part on this molecule down here would be clashing with this positive piece. So that's not how it's going to interact. It's going to actually orient itself more like this. Now this partially negative side is interacting with this partially positive side, and that is a dipole interaction. And so that is a very strong, <coughs> strong or a stronger intramolecular interaction. So is it like is it astronomically large, or is that interaction inter astronomically large? No. Because look at the difference between these two. There is a difference, but there's not this drastic difference between these two. All right. So what that can tell us there is that uh, these dipole moments right here, or these dipole interactions, not as strong as hydrogen bonding. But it's still something that changes those boiling points. All right. Now, let's take a look at the difference in boiling points of different ethers. Now, when we take a look at these three different ethers, they're all going to have the same uh, types of intramolecular interactions. Van der Waals and dipoles. Okay. But there is going to be a difference in boiling point. And we see that this, we've already seen this one. Diethyl ether right here, 35 degrees. And then this one, 91. So when we take a look at these three different molecules, we can see the similarities. They all have oxygens. They're all ethers, so that means they have, all have the same type of intramolecular interactions. But clearly, they have di stronger intramolecular interactions than from one another. Because this one's 91, this is 35. So that means this ether right here has a stronger intramolecular interactions. But which one? Right. And the one that's causing the greatest difference is the, the size of these groups right here. You see how we have two carbons versus three? 
So because we have more carbons, there's going to be more surface area. And if there's more surface area, then that can increase. <coughs> so if I just draw one half of the ether, well, let's draw all the ether. Look at this surface area right here. So since there's so much surface area, that could have a lot of what? Van der Waal forces. But when you take a look at the diethyl ether, it has less surface area, so less van der Waal forces. And then the ether right, <coughs> the dimethyl ether right there, doesn't really have a lot of surface area. So as you increase the size of that alkyl group, you're going to increase van der Waal forces, which then is going to increase your boiling point. Is that pretty slick? We now have something called a crown ether. Now, what are ethers? That's the generic structure, right? So, when we take a look at this molecule right here, is it an ether? Well, there's an oxygen that's sandwiched between two carbons. So yes, it is an ether. And same with this molecule and same with this molecule. But we call them crown ethers because they're, they look like a crown. They're cyclic and they kind of look like a crown, okay? It may be a stretch, but that's what we call them. They're called crown ethers. And when you take a look at the, how you name crown ethers, it's really simple. You count how many total atoms are in the, the eth crown ether except for the hydrogens. So you're just counting oxygens and carbons. And when you count that, you'll see that this crown ether has 12 atoms. <coughs> so you go 12 atoms, crown, and then how many oxygens? There's four. So that's a 12 crown four ether. If we do the same process here, that would be a 15 crown five. Five oxygens. One, two, three, four, five. <clears throat> and then you guys could do this one. What how many atoms are there? 18. How many oxygens? One, two, three, four, five, six. There. So we have these different types of crown ethers. And what's interesting about these crown ethers is they, one purpose that they serve is that they help to solvate cations. So you have some common cations here. <coughs> Let's say lithium. We have sodium and potassium. Okay. Now when you take a look at those cations, which one is the largest? So we could say, okay, potassium is the largest, sodium is the next, and then lithium would be the smallest. Okay. So we have different sizes of cations and different sizes of crown ethers. And what's amazing here is that these crown ethers are just the right size to fit a particular cation. So the 18 crown six ether is the largest amongst these three. So you would envision that because it's the largest, it would fit the largest cation. So what you have is potassium can fit perfectly in the center of this crown ether. And when you have this potassium in here, so let's represent it by just the atom right there, that fits perfectly in there. What's going to happen is you have lone pairs all on these oxygen atoms. And this, this species right here in the middle, what is it? It's positively charged. So you're going to have these interactions right here. And so these crown ethers, they just allow for the cation <coughs> to sit in the center, and typically they're pretty selective. Not perfectly selective, 
but for our purposes, we'll say this crown ether really fit, fits the potassium very, very well. The potassium does not fit in the 15 crown ether. And here you would have our sodium. Same concept here, right? And that's going to be positively charged. It fits perfectly. And then you would see our lithium right there, all right? So crown ethers can you be used in uh, areas of research where you want to remove cations from your system, whatever you're studying. So crown ethers can be designed or used to selectively say, hey, we want to remove out the potassium. So we'll add in 18 crown, 18 crown 6 ether to remove that. Okay. Now it can also be used in some reactions to help reactions that otherwise would not work without the crown ether. So we've seen up to this point that if we wanted to treat this, let's say, with <coughs> potassium fluoride, okay, and we put this in an organic solvent, let's say benzene. There, benzene. What I want to have happen is I like, I know that's ionic. So if it dissolves right here, okay, like so, I want that fluoride to be uh, separated so we could do just a simple SN2 type reaction, just to do a substitution. Let's make sure we have the same carbons. I think we're missing some. Okay, it's like that. <clears throat> so, more often than not, fluoride right here is not a very good um, nucleophile, okay? Why? Why does the fluoride add anion not typically work well? The reason why fluoride typically is not a good nucleophile in most reactions is because a lot of times we do reactions in protic solvents or polar solvents. And so if you have these polar protic solvents here, the fluoride is going to interact very strongly with the solvent. That's because we have a fluoride which is relatively small and it has a, a full charge on it. And we've learned that with the uh, anion smaller, it's going to interact very strongly with the solvent. And so that's a problem, okay? So one way we can circumvent this is by adding it to benzene, if we want to do this reaction, and add a crown ether that can also disrupt this ionic interaction between the anion and the cation because that's also a very, very strong interaction. And if that's interacting very strongly, then it's not going to behave as a very strong nucleophile. So if you add a crown ether that can capture that, so what ether would we add? Well, we have to go into our book or into our notes and be like, okay, what crown ether was designed to capture potassium? And that is our 18 crown six ether. And now, when you do this reaction, when the potassium fluoride separates, the crown ether is going to snatch up the potassium. So what you have going on here is you have like a pretty free fluoride floating around, not interacting with its cation because it's gobbled up by the crown ether. So this, this fluoride here can do our SN2 like that and form our product. So if I change this problem up a little bit, 
What if I added sodium fluoride? Would these reaction conditions be optimal to do this overall transformation? <clears throat> and hopefully all of you will be would say no, it's not optimal conditions because we're using the wrong crown ether. Because this 18 crown ether was designed for what? Potassium. Which one was designed for sodium? That was the 15 crown ether. Right. So that's this is one way to uh, make uh, a fluorine alkanes right. or fluorinated alkanes. So that's a, a pretty slick way to do things. So I've just shared with you some practical uses for why crown ethers are important. It helps with these uh, reactions here. Right. Let's see, let's start talking about other ways to make, let's talk about ways to make ethers, all right? So in this particular case, we used an ether to help us do a reaction. But now let's talk about how to actually make ethers. So Williamson ether synthesis is a way to make ethers. And so if we look at a general reaction, it's where you're going to take an alcohol, and the alcohols have to be typically primary alcohols. Okay. No, no, I, I take that back. It's not the alcohol. So we take an alcohol. And we can treat it, now we have two steps here. Reaction one is where you treat it with sodium hydride, or you could use sodium hydroxide. What you're doing is you're just generating the alkoxide. You're adding a base to rip off one of these hydrogens. And so that would generate our alkoxide. And then step two, step two, you're going to add in your alkyl halide. So Rx. Now this alkyl halide right here has to be primary. A primary alkyl halide. Okay. Now why is this the case? Why does this have to be primary? It's because the mechanism is a SN2 mechanism. Could you do a secondary alkyl halide? <clears throat> you could, but what you now introduce is now you have a strong uh, electron, electron rich species. It's negatively full blown charged. So you can have a lot of competition. So you could have elimination and substitution. So typically you want a primary alkyl halide. And so mechanistically, what do we have going on here? It's just going to do a SN2. And the, the halogen right here can be chlorine, bromine, iodine, because those are the halogens that are good leaving groups. And then what do you generate? You would generate your ether. So if we designate that one as R1, we go R1 like that. Okay. So overall, what you can say is with a Williamson ether synthesis, is that you're going to take a alcohol right here, <clears throat> treat it with sodium hydride or <clears throat> sodium hydroxide, and then in step two, you would add in your alkyl halide. 
and that is a SN2 mechanism. So making sure your alkyl halide is primary and that would then give us our product. So like we've been discussing in class, you have to show it numerated. Step one, step two. If you just erased it all, those numbers there, and said do the reaction, that's saying it's in one pot. <coughs> and that's not going to work. It has to be stepwise. Step one, step two. Has to, has to, has to. Okay, so that's the Williamson ether synthesis. So let's take a look at some examples here to highlight this part <coughs> as to why it's so important to use a primary alkyl halide. So what if our target is this compound right here, right there. That's the target compound, right? So when we look at our target compound, we can look at it in how, how we're going to look at it like how are we going to synthesize that? Well, we know we need what, what two pieces? An alcohol and a alkyl halide, okay? So I could take a look at this molecule and say, hey, what if I chop this bond right there? If I chop that bond right there, I could say, hey, I'm going to want, let's take that terpetal piece right there, okay, and turn that into what? A halogen. I could do that. And then if, I, if that piece right there is turned into the halogen, then this piece right here would have to be the alcohol. Now, did you see that? Now, what if I did it in a different manner? What, in, what if instead I wanted to chop this bond right there? Then that would mean we would have a fragment that looks like this. So that piece right there turns into the tributanol, all right? And then what would this piece turn into? There, there's a carbon, CH3, and we would just tack on the halogen. So there's our two pieces, alcohol plus our halogen. So in this particular case, there's two ways that we are hypothesizing to make this target compound using the Williamson ether synthesis. So which one would actually work? <coughs> well, if we take our, this top example here, that would be, these markers are dying here. So let's, let's see if we can get some markers with a little bit more juice here. So there's my alcohol and I would treat that with Step one, which would be, let's just use sodium hydride. And what's that going to generate? That's going to generate our alkoxide, like so. And then I would treat that alkoxide with my alkyl halide, which is that compound right there. Now, mechanistically, what do we, what are we going to do? Well, we know that this is a SN2 mechanism. So if we draw in our lone pairs here, go like that, go like that, we would now generate what? Like so. That could generate our, prod <coughs> our product. 
But we need to go and say, whoa, 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 let's slow down here. Do you see what's wrong? What type of alkyl halide is this? That is a tertiary alkyl halide. Do tertiary alkyl halides undergo SN2? They don't. So this proposed synthesis is not going to work because we generated a tertiary alkyl halide. So we're like, scrap that. That is not going to work. So we go to our second one right here. Now we have what? We have our terbutanol right there. We treat that with sodium hydride or sodium hydroxide. That will generate our alkoxide. And then in step two, we would treat that with our alkyl halide right here. And then what are we going to do? A simple SN2 mechanism. And that's going to be... Now, does that work? <coughs> yes. We see that this is an SN2 mechanism. We see that, that that's a primary alkyl halide. That's going to work. Okay. Well, let me correct this. This is te technically not a primary alkyl halide. That would be a methyl halide. All right. So what would a, so let's just double, let's just review that so there's no confusion. So when you just have a methyl group attached to a halogen, that's a methyl halide. Now, if you have one more carbon, that right there is a primary, because how do we figure out the degrees of a alkyl halide? We find the carbon that the halogen is attached to, which is shown in the circle. How many carbons are directly attached to that one? One. So if I have that, that is a, there's one, car, that's the carbon that the, the halogen is attached to, one, two. So that would be secondary. And then if we added another methyl group right there, that would be tertiary. So Williamson ether synthesis only works if the alkyl halide is a methyl halide or a primary halide. And it might work a little bit with a secondary alkyl halide. But you would get a lot of elimination product with a secondary alkyl halide. Okay. So this compound right here This one right here is, was used a lot. It's called MTBE right there. That was a additive that they uh, put in gasoline. But now there's fears that it's contaminating groundwater, and so they've slowly stopped using it. So that's our MTBE. But a little interesting history lesson here is that this ether right here, the name is called terbutyl, terbutyl, let's see, methyl ether. Okay, there's one way to, uh, <coughs> to name it. Okay. Now, <laughs> what's interesting here, why is it um, MTBE? It's because <laughs> the history is that they, they uh, didn't name this molecule right for the longest time. Okay. Let's see here. What did they usually... Let's see here. They honestly called it methyl terbutyl ether. They swapped 
these right here. And you know why they did that? Is because they're like, hey, M comes before T. So it should be methyl terbutyl ether. That's incorrect according to the IUPAC, right? Because do we use the prefixes in the IUPAC name in, or use it for alphabetical order? No, we don't. What do we use? We ignore that and use that. B comes before M. But this was used for so long, it's kind of just stuck. But technically, it's not correct. Okay? <clears throat> so looking at the acronym kind of would confuse you because it's actually swapped. Kind of interesting, okay? So just something to be aware of. I think that's just funny history in the chemistry world here. Okay, so that's the Williamson ether synthesis. There's going to be one more synthesis or reaction that I want to talk about in this video. And so I'm going to clean up this board and we'll, we'll start talking about it. Recall from previous lectures where if we took a alkane, sorry, alkene, okay, do you see how we have one carbon more substituted than the other? Paying attention to that, so we have a hydrogen there. What if we treated this molecule with mercury diacetate? Okay. We treat it with mercury diacetate in water, and then we work that up, or we add in our sodium borohydride. Do you remember the product of that reaction? Do you remember how that it's going to generate a alcohol? So that's our R group, and then our alcohol's there. That hydrogen, that one right there is already there. And then we're just going to add another one from this reduction step. Right there. <coughs> to remember the intermediate here, how you form a abridged compound like this? draw that kind of more like over there and then you have the mercury acetate right here oh ac goodness all right remember that uh intermediate right there so let's see here that's going to be positively charged positively charged only one of the acetates is on there. Remember that? And then water is going to come in and what? Attack the more substituted side. Remember that reaction? So the oxymercuration, demercuration of to form our alcohols here, right? So look at that. That's one way to make a <coughs> tertiary alcohol. So what does this have anything to do with what we're talking about today? Well, look at this. Look how interesting this is. If we take this water in step one and replace it with a alcohol, the name of this reaction changes ever so slightly. <coughs> well, Put that oxygen as a lower case. <coughs> so now this whole reaction now is a alkoxy mercuration, demercuration. And so what happens here? It's the same mechanism. This water molecule now, right here, let's see, put an R there. H there, like so. 
same exact mechanism. And so what's this? It has an R attached to it, right? Like so. Look at that. What have we now made? We made a ether. So an alkoxy mercuration demercuration reaction just takes the oxymercuration demercuration of alkenes, converting it to alcohol, and just replacing what was water into an alcohol. So slick. So we have two ways that we just went over today with how to make ethers. We have Williamson ether synthesis and the alkoxy mercuration demercuration reaction. All right. So as always, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out. I'll be more than happy to help. And I hope these videos are useful too.